Hey guys and welcome back to the third neural network tutorial. Now in today's video we're actually going to be working with the neural network so we're going to be setting up a model, we're going to be training that model, and we're going to be testing that model to see how well it performed. We will also use it to predict on individual images and all of that fun stuff. So without further ado, let's get started. Now the first thing that I want to do before we really get into actually writing any code is talk about the architecture of the neural network we're going to create. Now I always found in tutorials that I watched they never really explained exactly what the layers were doing, what they looked like, and why we chose such layers. And that's what I'm hoping to give to you guys right now. So if you remember before, we know now that our images, they come in essentially as like 28 by 28 pixels. And the way that we have them is we have an array and we have another array inside. It's so like a two dimensional array and it has pixel values. So maybe it's like 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.3, which is the grayscale value. And this goes and there's times 28 in each row of these um, these pixels. Now there's 28 rows, obviously, because, well, 28 by 28 pixels. So in here again, we have the same thing, more pixel values, and we go down 28 times, right? And that's what we have, and that's what our array looks like. Now that's what our input data is, that's fine, but this isn't really gonna work well for our neural network. What are we gonna do? We're gonna have one neuron, and we're just gonna pass this whole thing to it, I don't think so. That's not going to work very well. So what we need to actually do before we can even like start talking about the neural network is figure out a way that we can change this information into a way that we can give it to the neural network. So what I'm actually going to do and what I mean most people do is they they do what's called flatten the data. So actually maybe we'll go uh, I can't even go back once I clear it. But flattening the data essentially is taking any like interior list. So let's say we have like lists like this and just like squishing them all together. So rather than, so let's say this is like one, two, three, if we were to flatten this, what we would do is, well, we would remove all of these interior arrays or lists or whatever it is. So we would just end up getting data that looks like one, two, three. And this actually turns out to work just fine for us. So in this instance, we only had like one element in each array, but when we're dealing with 28 elements in each, sorry, list, list and array, they're interchangeable, just in case I keep saying those. Uh, what we'll essentially have is we'll flatten the data so we get a list of length 784. And I believe that is because, well, I mean, I know this is because 28 times 28 equals 784. So when we flatten that data, so 28 rows of 28 pixels, then we end up getting 784 pixels just one after each other. And that's what we're going to feed in as the input to our neural network. So that means that our initial input layer is going to look something like this. We're going to have a bunch of neurons and they're going to go all the way down. So we're going to have 784 neurons. So let's say this is 784. I know you could probably hardly read that, but you get the point. And this is our input layer. Now, before we even talk about any kind of hidden layers, let's talk about our output layer. So what is our output? Well, our output is going to be a number between zero and nine. Ideally, that's what we want. So what we're actually going to do for our output layer is rather than just having one neuron that we used kind of in the last uh, the two videos ago as an example, is we're actually going to have 10 neurons, each one representing one of these different classes, right? So we have zero to nine. So obviously 10 neurons or 10 classes. So let's have 10 neurons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, what's going to happen with these neurons is each one of them is going to have a value and that value is going to represent how much the network thinks that it is each neuron. So, for example, say we're classifying the image um, that looks like a T-shirt uh, or maybe like a pair of pants. So those are pretty easy to draw. So let's say this is the image we're given a little pair of pants. What's going to happen is let's say pants is like this one, like this is the one it actually should be. All of these will be lit up a certain amount. So essentially, maybe we'll say like we think it's 0.05% this. We have like a degree of certainty that it's 10% this one. And then it is like we think it's 75% pants. So what we'll do when we are looking at this output layer is essentially we'll just find whatever one is the greatest. So whatever probability is the greatest. And then say that's the one that the network predicts is uh, the class of the given object, right? So when we're training the network, what we'll do essentially is we'll say, okay, well, we're giving the pants. So we know that this one should be one, right? This should be 100% 
it should be one. Uh, that's what it should be. And all these other ones should be zero, right? Because it should be a 0% chance it's anything else because we know that it is pants. And then the network will look at all this and adjust all the weights and biases accordingly so that we get it so that it lights this one up directly as one. At least that's our goal, right? So uh, once we do that, so now we've talked about the input layer and the output layer. Now it's time to talk about our hidden layers. So we could technically train a network that would just be two layers, right? And we just have all these inputs that go to some kind of outputs, but that wouldn't really do much for us because essentially that would just mean we're just going to look at all the pixels and based on that configuration of pixels, we'll point to, you know, these output layers. And that means we're only going to have, which I know it sounds only 784 times 10 weights and biases. So 784 times 10, which means that we're only going to have 7,840 uh, weights, right? Weights and biases, things to adjust. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to add a hidden layer inside of here. Now you can kind of arbitrarily, arbitrarily pick how many neurons you're going to have in your hidden layer. It's a good idea to kind of go off based on percentages from your input layer. But what we're going to have is we're going to have a hidden layer. And in this case, this hidden layer is going to have 128 neurons. So we'll say this is 128 and this is known as our hidden layer. So what will happen now is we're going to have our inputs connecting to the hidden layer. So fully connected. And then the hidden layer will be connected to all of our output neurons, which will allow for much more complexity of our network because we're going to have a ton more biases and a ton more weights connecting to this middle layer, which maybe we'll be able to figure out some patterns. Like maybe it'll look for like a, st a straight line that looks like a pant sleeve or looks like an arm sleeve. Maybe to look for concentration of a certain area in the picture, right? And that's what we're hoping that our hidden layer will maybe be able to do for us. Maybe pick on pick up on some kind of patterns. And then maybe with these combination of patterns, we can pick out what specific image it actually is. Now, we don't really know what the hidden uh, network or hidden layer is going to do. We just kind of have some hopes for it. And by picking 128 neurons, we're saying, okay, we're going to allow this hidden layer to kind of figure its own way out and figure out some way of analyzing this image. And then that's essentially what we're going to do. So if you have any questions about that, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, but the hidden layers are pretty arbitrary. Sorry, I just dropped my pen, which means that, you know, you can kind of experiment with them, kind of tweak with them. There's some that are known to be to do well, but typically when you're picking a hidden layer, you pick one and you typically go at like maybe 15, 20% of the input size. But again, it really depends on the application that you're, you're using. So let's now actually just start um, working with our data and creating a model. So if we want to create a model, the first thing we, that we need to do is define the architecture or the layers for our model. And that's what we've just done. So I'm going to type it out fairly quickly here. And again, you guys will see how this works. So I'm going to say model equals, in this case, keras.sequential, I believe that's how you spell it. And then what we're going to do is inside of here, put a list and we're going to start defining our different layers. So we're going to say keras.layers. And our first layer is going to be an input layer but it's going to be a flattened input layer and the input underscore shape is going to be equal to 28 by 28. So remember I talked about that initially what we need to do is well, we need to flatten our data so that it is uh, passable to all of those different neurons, right? So essentially, Oh, I got to spell shape correctly, shape correctly. So essentially whenever you're passing in information that's in like a 2d or 3d array, you need to flatten that information so that you're going to be able to pass it to an individual neuron as opposed to like, sending a whole list into one neuron, right? Now, the next layer that we're going to have is going to be what's known as a dense layer. Now, a dense layer essentially just means a fully connected layer, which means that what we've showed so far, which is only fully connected neural networks, uh, that's what we're going to have. So each node or each neuron is connected to every other neuron in the next network. So we're going to say layers dot dense. And in this case, we're going to give it 128 neurons. That's what we've talked about. And we're going to set the activation function, which we've talked about before as well, to be rectify linear unit. Now, again, uh, this activation function is somewhat arbitrary in the fact that you can pick different ones. But rectify linear unit is a very fast activation function and it works well for a variety of applications. And that is why we are picking that. Now, the next layer is going to be another dense layer, which means essentially another fully connected uh, layer. Sorry. And we're going to have 10 neurons. This is going to be our output layer and we're going to have an activation of softmax. Now what softmax does is exactly what I explained uh, when showing you that kind of architecture picture. It will 
uh, pick values for each neuron so that all of those values add up to one. So essentially it is like the probability of the network, uh, thinking it's a certain value. So it's like, I believe that it's 80% this, uh, 2% this, 5% this, but all of the neurons there, those values will add up to one. And that's what the soft max soft max function does. So that actually means that we can look at the last layer and we can see the uh, probability or what the network thinks for each given class. And say maybe those are two classes that are like 45% each, we could maybe tweak the output of the network to say like, I am not sure rather than predicting a specific uh, value, right? All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just set up some uh, parameters for our model. So we're gonna say model.compile. And in this case, we're gonna use an optimizer of Atom. Now I'm not really gonna talk about the optimizer. Uh, Atom is typically like pretty standard, especially for something like this. We're gonna use the loss function of sparse. And in this case, underscore categorical, uh, I believe I spelled that correctly. And then cross entropy. Now, if you're interested in what these do and how they work in terms of like the math kind of side of them, just look them up. There's, they're very famous and popular and they're, they're again are somewhat arbitrary in terms of how you pick them. Now, when I do metrics, I'm going to say metrics equals accuracy. And again, this is just going to define what uh, we're looking at when we're testing the model. In this case, we care about the accuracy or how low we can get this loss function to be. So yeah, you guys can look these up. There's tons of different loss functions. Some of them have different applications. And typically when you're making a neural network, you're, you'll mess around with different loss functions, different optimizers, and in some cases, different metrics. So now it is actually time to train our model. So to train our model, what we're going to do is model.fit. And when we fit it, all we're going to do is give it our train images and our train labels. Now we're going to set the amount of epochs. So now it's time to talk about epochs. Now epochs are actually fairly straightforward. You've probably heard of the word epoch before, but essentially it means how many times the model is going to see this information. So what an epoch is going to do is it's going to kind of randomly pick um, images and labels, obviously corresponding to each other. And it's going to feed that through the neural network. So how many epochs you decide is how many times you're going to see the same image. So the reason we do this is because the order in which images come in will influence how parameters and things are tweaked with the network. Maybe seeing like 10 images that are pants is going to tweak it differently than if it sees like a few that are pants and a few that are um, a shirt and some that are sandals. So this is a very simple explanation of how the epochs work, but essentially it just is giving um, the same images in a different order. And then maybe if it got one image wrong, it's going to see it again and be able to tweak. And it's just a way to increase hopefully the accuracy of our model. That being said, giving more epochs does not always necessarily increase the accuracy of your model. It's something that you kind of have to play with. And anyone that does any machine learning or neural networks will tell you that they can't really like they don't know the exact number of epochs, they have to play with it and tweak it and see what gives them the best accuracy. So anyways, now it is time to actually, uh, well, we can run this, but let's first get some kind of output here. So I'm going to actually evaluate this model directly after we run it so that we can see how it works on our test data. So right now, what this is doing is actually just training the model on our training data, which means we're tweaking all the weights and biases. Um, we're applying all those activation functions and we're defining like a main function for the model. But if we actually want to see how this works, we can't uh, really just test it on the training images and labels for the same reason I talked about before. So we have to test it on the test images and the test labels and essentially see how many it gets correct. So the way we do this is we're going to say uh, test underscore loss test underscore AC, which stands for accuracy equals model dot evaluate. Is that how you spell it? Maybe. And then we're going to do test images, test underscore labels. And I believe that is the last parameter. Yes, it is. So now if we want to see the accuracy of our model, we can simply print out test underscore ACC. And we'll just say like tested ACC, just so we know, because there is going to be some other metrics that are going to be printing out to us when we run this. All right. So now that we've done that, let's actually run our file and see how this works. So this is it. This whole part here is all we actually need to do to create a neural network and do a model. Now, actually, let me just quickly say that this Keras sequential, what this does is it means a, like a sequence of layers. So you're just defining them in order where you say the first layer obviously is going to be your input layer. 
we're, we're flattening the data then we're adding two dense layers which are fully connected to the input layer as well and that's what our model looks like and this is typically how you go about creating a neural network all right so let's run this now and see what we get so this will take a second or two to run um, just because obviously there is, well, we have 60,000 images in this data set. So, you know, it's got to run through them. It's doing all the epochs and you can see that we're getting uh, metrics here on our accuracy and our loss. Now our test accuracy was 87%. So you can see that that's actually slightly lower than, um, what do you call it? Like the accuracy here. Oh, it's the exact same. Oh, it, it actually auto tested on some data sets, but anyways, so essentially that is, um, how this works. You can see that the first five epochs, which are these ones here, uh, ran and they increase typically with each epoch. Now, again, we could try like 10 epochs, 20 epochs and see what it does. But there is a point where the more epochs you do, the actual, like the less reliable your model becomes. Uh, and you can see that our accuracy was started at 88.9 essentially. And that was on, like, that's what it said our model accuracy was when we were training the model. But then once we actually tested it, which are these two lines here, uh, it was lower than the, the tested or like the trained accuracy, which shows you that you obviously have to be testing on different images because when we tested it here, it said, well, it was 89%, but then here we only got 87%, right? So let's do a quick uh, tweak here and just see what we get. Maybe if we add like 10 epochs, uh, I don't think this will take a crazy long amount of time. So we'll run this and see maybe if it makes a massive difference or if it starts leveling out or it starts going lower or whatnot. Uh, so let me let this run here for a second. And obviously you can see the tweaked accuracy as we continue to go. I'm interested to see here if we're going to increase by much or if it's just kind of going to stay at the same level. All right, so we're hitting about 90%. And let's see here. 91. Okay, so uh, we got up to 91%, but you can see that it was kind of diminishing returns as soon as we ended up getting to about seven epochs. Even, yeah, even like eight epochs after this, we only increased by a marginal amount, and our accuracy on the testing data was slightly better. But again, for the amount of epochs, five extra epochs, it did not give us a five times better result, right? So it's something you got to play with and see. So anyways, that has been it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to continue using this model a little bit to actually predict on individual images. I know I said I was going to do that in this video, but it's gotten a bit longer. Uh, so let's move that into the next video. If you guys enjoyed, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you again there.